Stop crying. Save your tears for when your mother dies. This one will have you in tears. Let's get into it. Welcome to Buggish. Hello everyone, my name is Jemima if you're new here and welcome to today's Bookish video. This is Bookish 11. If you are new here, Bookish is when I talk about the books I've either listened to on Audible or physically read and share some topics, ideas or just the different feelings I have. I don't do a Bookish on every single book that I you know, listen to or read. However, there are some that I feel that I would like to create some sort of discussion with. Video essay slash commentary base slash a bit of a book review in general. Depending on the book, sometimes I give more spoilers than others. However, when I do share and talk about the books, it does not mean that you can't go and experience them for yourself. That is what bookish is about and I have got so many more bookish plans. It does take me a little while with these bookish videos, but I am going to try to get consistent and at least like one bookish video every month hopefully by 2023 because this book that I'm about to share with you I read it all the way back in June and so I've just been like simmering and lingering with it for like six months I could have brought it out much sooner but timing wise I'm just trying to get as organized as possible Today I want to share with you guys a very special book. Like I knew I was going to like this but it really has a special place in my heart now and I feel like such an emotional connection to this book. And so the book I want to share with you guys is Crying in H Mart, a memoir by Michelle Zorno. And so this is different to the type of books I usually come on here and talk about. This is not fiction. This is someone's real life. Um, their real experiences. Crying in H Mart is about Michelle and her mother Chong Min's relationship. It follows the journey of before and after Chong Min finds out about her cancer diagnosis, as well as during the process of chemotherapy and unfortunately when she passes away. Michelle opens up about growing up half Korean and how culture impacted her life. As someone who's lost a parent to cancer and also experiencing that at such a young age, I thought this book would be relatable and comforting. And so like I said, this book is deeply personal and she really is just sharing her heart with us. And I have never read anything like this. It stands out to me particularly because of the way Michelle blends food recipes and memories. Michelle unravels bits of her past through reminiscing and flashbacks. And there is such an emphasis on how powerful words and conversations are. And it shows how communication can impact a relationship. For example, a language barrier adding feelings of distance and exclusion. The first topic I want to talk about is culture, as this is the centre of the book. Here are some definitions of culture. The ideas, customs and social behaviour of a particular people or society. The way of life, especially the general customs and beliefs of a particular group of a people at a particular time. Edgar Sheehan defines culture as a pattern of shared basic assumptions learned by a group as it solves its problem of external adaptation and internal integration which has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think and feel in relation to those problems. Crying in Hedgemark highlights the importance of culture and how it can impact identity. Michelle is half Korean and American. That is her ethnicity. However, Michelle always felt insecure about identifying as Korean. As someone of mixed heritage, she struggled with belonging. Culture is complex, it includes language, food, traditions, as well as music, beauty, religion and so much more. Culture is the way people feel connected to the community and it impacts their upbringing. And how you see life is greatly influenced by the culture that you are surrounded by. And specifically within Korean culture, one vital part is the language. They even have different dialects representing different parts of South Korea that you are from. If you speak the language, it is easier for you to integrate and build relationships. However, when there's a language barrier, it can cause disconnect and create distance. From as simply as not being able to get around the city to just having a normal conversation with someone. Especially in group settings, the problem shows so much more when everyone else can speak the language but you. It can make you feel a bit left out and you worry about constantly asking for translation. Because even though you do get it, you might not understand the full context and sometimes you worry about being annoying. I personally have had this happen to me and the people around me have always been really lovely about it, but I have always felt just that distance of not fully knowing what's going on for myself. And similarly, like me, Michelle also had different experiences where she was not able to communicate. 
During her summer breaks growing up, she would visit Seoul and she would stay at her Halmini's apartment. Though she was among family, she struggled to build a relationship with her grandmother and one of her aunts because of this language barrier. She always had to speak through her mother or her other aunt who would translate. And all she could do was really watch from afar and observe, but never really understand why her Halmini was so harsh with words and affection. And then there are some people who use language to manipulate and they try to create cliques and not community. See, though language is important, it is not the only thing that makes a culture. And so therefore, just because you can't speak the language, it does not disqualify you. However, back in America, when Chong Ming was going through her chemotherapy, she had one of her friends staying with her. And this Unni purposely spoke Korean in the house so that Michelle and her father would understand what was going on. This Unni did it to create closeness and similarity and exclude those who aren't Korean. And this added to Michelle's anxiety because why was she being left out even though she is half Korean? This same Unni would also say things like that's how Koreans eat when Michelle would ask about food preparation. And even worse, she didn't even let Michelle try to cook some Korean food for her mum. Which is the next pillar of culture, food. Koreans are big on food. The way it is prepared, how it is eaten, and the places where you can actually find your food. For example, fish markets and street vendor stores. There are main staple dishes like kimchi. There are special occasion dishes such as seaweed soup for birthdays. And soft, easy to digest porridge for pregnant women and sick people. Michelle's mother had one rule. You had to try food at least once before you decided that you did not like it. And sometimes to bond and get her mother's approval, Michelle would try to impress her by how much she could eat. And Chongmi showed her love through food. When Michelle would taste the dishes, she could feel the warmth from her mother. The care and effort she put in remembering what people like. And so when Michelle's mother was going through her cancer period, she wanted to cook some Korean dishes for her. However, she did not know how to. And this Unni did not want to help. After her mother passed away, learning Korean dishes was something that she desired so much. It played such a significant role in her upbringing. It was something she ate every single day. And so it was crucial for her to try to hold on because she started to feel like something was missing. One question that Michelle kept wondering about was, now that her mother, who was the bridge to her Korean culture, had died, was she still Korean? Not having language was tough, but being without Korean food was unbearable. Michelle searched for YouTube tutorials and became obsessed with learning as many dishes as possible. She felt so proud of herself when she would explore Korean food. The next topic I want to discuss is relationships and specifically mother and daughters. It is truly unfortunate that sometimes in life, when you realise how precious something is, it might be too late. While growing up, Charming would say, save your tears for when your mother dies. This was her way to toughen up Michelle. It was a blunt comment that meant nothing is that serious. And so this mindset prevented intimacy because it showed that vulnerability was a weakness. Don't show you are hurt. And if Michelle did cry, she did not receive comfort. She got told off instead. Mother-daughter relationships can be complex and sometimes complicated. Some mothers and daughters can be like best friends, whereas some have more turbulent relationships. For example, during the teenage periods, it can get quite heated up because of hormones. However, when a daughter reaches her 20s and starts to settle down a bit, she does begin to appreciate her mother again like that childlike state. And so I can relate to Michelle and Chong Min's relationship. Though I was not so much a rebellious teen, I did have instances where I felt that my mother did not understand me. And so I closed myself up because I just thought she did not understand how much I was suffering. And this can be the main reason for tension. When you feel that your feelings are not being heard or respected in the way that you would like it to be. With Michelle and her mother, it particularly got sour when she said she wanted to become a musician and her mother told her it was a pipe dream. One conversation in particular, Chong Mi said, I've just been waiting for you to give this up like the other hobbies. I regret giving you guitar lessons. And that stung Michelle so much that her mother was not supportive of her dreams and didn't want her to pursue something that meant so much to her. But honestly, many daughters do wish to have their mother's approval. However, Chong Ming was very strict and judgmental. Once they started to live apart, Chong Ming did show more grace. Still, there was that little girl inside of Michelle that wanted mom to be proud. This came out particularly during the wedding scenes, from when she went dress shopping to actually getting ready on her wedding day. All she could think about was whether or not her mother would think she looked beautiful. Moving on to my next point, which is wholeness. Another one of Chong Min's straightforward teachings was 
save 10% for yourself. When forming any type of relationship, family, friends, lovers, never let anyone have all of you. The truth is you may never really know someone fully because humans are always constantly changing and evolving. And there are times where people can get used to someone and don't take the time to continue to learn about them. And in that way, there are seasons where you'll be closer to someone and seasons where you'll be a bit more distant. Um, it is a nice idea to have someone who you can share every single thing with, but it is realistically very, very hard because that requires an amount of vulnerability that can be literally scary if you think about it. Some people do enjoy having that nice and comforting feelings of knowing that they can turn to that person anytime. They like that level of closeness, they like that level of intimacy, sharing everything. Tom Min stands of saving 10% for yourself comes from a place of wanting to protect herself from getting hurt. She built up this layers around her that in case of disappointment, she will not feel like she's lost herself. She was purposely secretive and sometimes lied in order to not allow anyone to enter her boundary lines. With this, I wonder, how do you choose what parts to hide? And why those parts? If I am honest, and this might surprise many people, I am actually for the idea of saving 10% for yourself. There is nothing wrong with having some private moments to keep to yourself. This can give you independence and also make it easier for the seasons when people come in and out of your life. If you relied solely on one person, it can create a type of codependence and attachment style and sometimes lean towards the they or your diary or they or your therapist and when really that's not what relationship is about. Getting to know someone and learning as much as possible is nice but you know you may not know every single thing about someone and that's perfectly fine. After her mother passed away, Michelle learned from her aunt some things her mother never shared to her personally. She thought it was interesting that the people left behind had pieces of her story and if they gathered together they can put some sort of picture of what her life was like. However, no one will be able to tell her story in its entirety because it was Chong Mi's story as a whole. Next, let's talk about self-care and this is very relevant to me and my channel because skincare. Beauty standards are interesting. In one country, your features are coveted, while in another, it is considered ugly. Every country has different perspectives and culture plays a part of it, but there's also a huge amount of media influence. Hollywood slash Western standards are pretty much everywhere, even in Korea, Nigeria, and India. One of the main aspects of desirability is skin lightness. I talk about colorism in my previous Bookish 10 video, so go watch that video if you want to learn a little bit about how colorism plays a part in job roles, entertainment industries, and other different aspects of life. As a mixed race person, I see how it can be challenging as you will have two cultures to balance. Michelle had double eyelids and a small face and she was always called Ipuda when she was in Korea. Her double eyelid features were praised and many people in Korea would have surgery just to get something that she was born with. It was the ideal type. Whereas in America, she faced the constant question of what are you? Being mixed race, she did have some Asian features and so the children at school would constantly ask her if she was Chinese or Japanese. Like those were the only two Asian countries. And so in middle school, she wanted to be as white as possible and not show any of her Korean culture from even changing her name and to not have any Korean dishes prepared for lunch. Like I said, skincare is my jam and it has been life changing for me to learn how to look after my skin. And because of that, I do believe that having a desire to keep your parents the best as possible is necessary and there's nothing wrong with that. However, I do not mean having unrealistic standards for perfection. I'm completely against things that make people feel like they have to fit into a mold. Too much obsession with beauty is vanity and it can actually cause a lot of damage. Instead, I believe the focus should be about achieving inner confidence and wellness through taking care of your outer shell. I particularly love skincare because it allows me to spend some time giving attention to my body and showing it that I appreciate it. It can feel great when I apply a soothing gel. And I also love it when my skin feels so soft. It's just things that make me feel good and therefore boost my confidence. Chami was someone who invested a large amount of time in her appearance. She was someone who really looked after herself. She had all the skincare products. She dressed well and she took care of her hair and she took care of her house. She took care of her body and also her physical home. And she was someone that believed that your appearance matters. She cared so much about what she looked like and what others looked like. It got to the point of nitpicking, especially when it came towards trying to help Michelle with her skincare and telling Michelle what to wear. And so cancer was especially tough for Chongmi, someone who cared so much about health and exercise and eating well and looking good. Cancer made her feel like she lost her beauty. All that work and effort that she put into self-maintenance all those years, it literally started to fall apart as soon as she started her cancer chemotherapy. 
one of the main things was her hair falling out. When someone is going through an illness, it is very evident as their body begins to deteriorate. And eating well and small exercises become the main focus of care, just so that you can keep up with treatment. The fun self-care part gets neglected because it's not seen as so much of a priority anymore. The one thing I did like about Chong Min's friend that was staying with them is that she gave Chong Min facial and painted her nails and gave her that experience of what she would normally do before cancer came. From that I learned that giving someone who's going for an illness a small experience of a facial, painting their nails, getting them dressed up and putting on makeup can give them some sort of serotonin boost and make them feel like how they used to be before the cancer or the sickness started to take over their life completely. Because self-care is really about mindfulness, being present in that moment and taking care of yourself. Now briefly I want to touch on pain. Chongmi's last word was in her mother dialect, Afa, which means pain. I might also be pronouncing it wrong and I might have said father. Sickness is painful. Chongmi suffered a lot. I don't have many words for this point, it just overwhelms me when I think about pain in general. Especially going through something like this, which is mentally, physically and soulfully painful. Everything in one and it literally consumes and eats and steals from you. Pain is just such a deep experience and it's very, very unfortunate. Michelle and her family also went through emotional pain, watching her mother go through all this pain. From the chemo treatment up until her mother actually passing away and Michelle having to dress her dead body up until the funeral and having to, understanding that when she's hearing all these new things about her mother, she's not gonna have access to her anymore. There was a real storm within her and it could have caused chaos if it was left undealt with. However, Michelle made an effort to heal and processed her pain through creativity. Michelle's heartbreaking album full of raw emotions reached many people who were also going through grief and come into terms with losing someone they loved. Finally, my last point is about traveling. Michelle is a musician and one of the main ways to promote your songs is by going on tour and this is also the main source of income alongside. During the early stages of her mother's illness when they first found out, Michelle had to do a small American tour but she was honestly hating the experience. Being on tour felt like a chore and her mind was not focused at all. Going on tour used to be something that she was so passionate about. However, during this sensitive period, being someone new every single day did not feel like an adventure, just felt like a burden. However, once Chong Mi did pass away, staying in one place then felt like hell. Michelle needed to escape and went on a trip for a few months with her father. The two left behind when traveling trying to figure out new boundaries and create a new bond as Michelle's mother was kind of what held them together. They did not really have a close relationship as father and daughter. Traveling with her father was messy and it was not always pleasant and there were many points they both felt empty and the absence of her mother was very, very strong still. Which shows that traveling in itself is not a quick fix. It is something that can help you start your healing process, but just thinking that running away or solve everything, you might be slightly disappointed. The journey was beneficial because it marked a chance for her to restart, come back to America refreshed, ready to live a life without her mother. Like I just mentioned, Michelle made songs about her mother's death and Japanese Breakfast, the band she was in, started to gain some popularity. Actually, not some popularity, quite a lot of popularity. And Michelle was excited about this change. She had the opportunity to go on tour again and she was especially excited because she was going to tour Asia and not just anywhere, she was going to perform in South Korea. Michelle was going to return to Seoul, the place where her mother was from, the place that is half her too, because she too is Korean. And with that, we've come to the end of today's bookish video. I'm going to start rating my books as people like to know what the overall experience means to me. And I think putting it on the scale, they kind of want to know which ones I like better and worse. For me personally, Crime in Hate Mark gets five out of five. Easily, non-stop, five stars, 10 out of 10, 100 points. I am truly in love with this book. Such beautiful writing. Such a hard, hard book to read, but it is told so well that you don't want to stop and you feel just so involved with this story and you just want to understand everything and feel all the emotions and it is honestly brilliant writing on Michelle's part and so like I said this book is not a happy book you are going to cry a lot 
yeah, it is truly one that you have to go and read for yourself and you just have to embrace that melancholy feeling. There is also those food moments that come up and it has feelings of coziness, it has feelings of bittersweet and it also has feelings of making me hungry because those recipes taste, I'm saying taste like I'm tasting it but literally I'm imagining it and I am craving it and I'm wanting it so bad. The way she has made these dishes sound so good not just the Korean dishes, just when she talks about food in general, she does it so well and she is very detailed creative and I did like how she brought forward all these different memories from food. And honestly, this book was just like a huge, huge like stop, pause. It was just a big reminder to appreciate life and also just have a desire to continue to learn and don't think that you've like reached the ceiling or that you're comfortable or you're settled. Like there is so much more to life that you just have to keep going and keep exploring and you know the whole point about traveling though it doesn't fix everything there is just so much that you can learn from traveling and experiencing other people's culture and yes culture was just a big part of this book and it made me think about my own culture and what it means to me i am full nigerian that is my ethnicity but i too sometimes struggle with feeling that i'm a part of my community when growing up, I never learned the main language, which is Yoruba. And I have had some people make fun of me because I don't know how to speak it. I also don't really believe in some Nigerian traditions and certain things like age or hierarchy. And it's like, yes, I will be rude to my seniors if they are rude to me. <laughs> and also I do not grow up eating Nigerian food all the time. I did have it occasionally, but it was not something that was always a main in my household. And because of that, I can cook about three main Nigerian dishes. It's a bit disappointing sometimes when I think about it and you know, I can sit here and blame my mom because you know, she didn't teach me. But at the same time, I'm also taking responsibility that when I was growing up, there was actually other cultures that I was more interested in and I didn't, have the desire to learn about my own. I was learning about the other things that I grew up surrounded by. I started watching anime from a very, very young age, about nine or 10. And I became obsessed with the Japanese culture. That in turn also led to K-dramas and Korean culture. And I was interested in learning about Asian languages and Asian food. However, over the last few years, definitely in my twenties, I have been thinking about how I did miss out on not appreciating my own culture growing up. And I have been wanting more Nigerian culture to be a part of my life. I used to say back in the days, I have no desire to visit Nigeria and I'm still like on the wave of if I will go back. But lately I've been thinking, who knows, I might visit Nigeria one day. Um, there's a lot of political things that go on there that make me not feel safe about that country. But it's not that I completely don't like my culture and my country and so I need to go on my own journey of embracing my own culture very, very soon. But despite me not feeling like 100% as if I belong, I have never wondered if I'm Nigerian. It is just who I am despite how much of the culture I participate in. Whereas people who are mixed race, they actually deal with quite a lot of people refuting them and challenging their identity. Culture is important, but even without it, you can still be a part of that ethnicity. You can still be that race. And I just honestly feel that Michelle Zona is half Korean. Like, let her claim her half without having to prove anything. Like, without having to take off these Korean classes, without having to take off these Korean dishes, without having to take off the Korean traditions. That is who she is. Her mother was a Korean lady who gave birth to her, and therefore she too is half Korean. I have linked this book down below. Let me know in the comment section if you've also read Crying in Hedgemar or you plan to read it sometime soon. If you have any more points to add about culture, relationships, wholeness, self-care, travel and pain, feel free to comment below or if you have anything else that I didn't touch on, feel free to comment below as well. Like I said, I do have more bookish videos planned. I'm going to do my best to try and get them out regularly and who knows, maybe start an official book club sometime in 2023 because that is where I've been, you know, trying to head with this. So definitely do stick around, engage with me, message me on Instagram, suggest books for me to read. Let's keep the conversation going and talking about how books can impact our lives and the different things we can learn from it. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, do remember to like, comment and subscribe ring in the notification bell so you know when I post and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!